Because often when I think of communion, it was bad, but good came through these things. And what really is good in the world around us? Uh, I don't think my clicker is working at all, guys. Don't worry. Wait. Plugging me back in. Now, there's lots of things around us that are either good or bad. And I want to ask the question this morning, what is good? What is good? Because the person next to you may say, you know, that is good. And you say, no, this is good. Uh, and you're not actually too sure. So what is good? Cal, that was good. Cool, I think I'm back on. Hey? What is good? Is it the cupcake or the carrots? Some of you I know are going to be clever and go, let's combine the two. Okay. You know, carrot cupcakes or something like that. You know, it's funny at the shop, somebody, and I, I'm totally with them, somebody, they wanted a real Coke, and they were given these options, and I wouldn't have taken any of those options either, you know. You can taste, those who are real good Coke connoisseurs will know, okay. You'll know, you know what, when you're not given the real stuff, okay. Some of you always a debate, okay. Tea or coffee, both, okay, some of you both. Bit of an easier one. <laughs> now, there's a, there's a saying that, uh, what is good? And I remember in, in church, there, I actually thought I'd walked into a bit of a cult, okay? Um, I, most of you will know my story. I didn't grow up in church. My parents didn't go to church. I got saved through the witness of a friend at their youth group, came to know Christ. My life changed dramatically. I didn't understand why or how. But I just knew that the bad which I did was no longer a slave to that, but I could actually be good as I followed Christ more and more. Uh, and that was kind of my, my story. And so I didn't grow up in church, and I moved to Durban. I walked into the church, and I remember the preacher got up, and he said, God is good. And everybody responded all the time. And everybody did it. So I was like, how come I don't know this stuff? You know, I actually thought I'd walked into a cult, and it... And there's that saying, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, and they would do this for about five, like five hours. Um, but sometimes it's hard to actually believe that God is good when there's difficult times. For many of you, you may have been in times in your life, or maybe you're in a time right now, and this seems to be the theme this in season. What, where is God when it's difficult? When you see a loved one suffering or the, the pain of a wayward child? So if you've got your Bibles this morning, we're going to just look at one simple verse, and maybe you know it. I actually quoted it last week, uh, but Romans 8, 28. Maybe some of you have been holding on to the, that verse in these times, and I just want to take us through this one verse, what God is saying to us when you're in a time where you're going, God, where are you? What is happening around us? Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. How many of you know that verse or have heard it in some form or way? The big question I've sometimes asked is, is God's definition of good the same as my definition of good? You know, the scan results are back and the cancer comes back. Or well, the business takes a dive again when you really believe God has been so faithful. Or another retrenchment. Or your spouse just becomes harder and harder to the things of, of faith. Is it true that all things work together for good? When the doctor turns around and says, all we can do is make them comfortable. In fact, I know for some of you, you've looked at this verse and gone, is it an unkept promise or, or is it even a lie? I know this is a bit of a hard one to start up this morning, but we've just been through to communion with doubt and worries as the disciples would have gone, God, how do we weigh up the things of this world in light of your word? Lord, I just pray that you'd speak to us in this verse. It just comes through with the clarity of what your heart is. For those of us who are sitting here right now and this morning, we're going, God, where are you in the midst of this? Where we doubt him. God, you've said, but I, I don't see the end. Lord, for some of us that have maybe turned our back on you, 
And actually, if our faith has become a religion, Lord, help us to hear your voice again, have prompted. Our cold and hardened hearts will be softened again. Lord, in the midst of our doubt, in the midst of pain, that we would look and find you again. In Jesus' name, amen. A few things about Romans 8, verse 28, uh, this morning. As, as it deals with the passage, because I've often heard this quoted and given to people, and how do we deal with it in our lives when our lives seem to be on a downward spiral? Or there's a circumstance where we're going, God, where are you? We doubt him. First of all, we've got to understand that this message is spoken to a group of believers. It was those who had trusted God with their lives. They had faith in Him and had the living Spirit within them. We see that in the previous verse in Romans 8 verse 28. This is a promise which is made to God's people. Now I want to tell you now, if you have faith in God and you're following, this is a verse that you can hold on to. When it just seems like this world is on a a roller coaster ride. In fact, it actually turns around. It says that Christians will receive an inheritance of God bound for glory. It says that we are going to get a great inheritance. But there's going to be some tough, rough times in this world. In fact, Romans 8 often speaks about our present suffering fails in compared to our future glory. So often we see people normally groan and who wait for Christ to come, especially as you get older, hey? See, Pat, I know you've said a couple times. You've said a couple times, you know, you can't wait for your heavenly body, okay? You can run fast again, hey? <laughs> we will get upgraded. Because, you know, what? in this world we have confusion and heartache. And it's in those times when we don't know what to say, that the Holy Spirit speaks. Even when we are confused by our circumstance and do not know what to say to God, this is when Romans 8 verse 28 comes into. I love this verse because what it does is reminds us that when we don't know all things, we can know one thing, that God is good. I just want to say there is, and if you haven't been or if you're in or if you're going to go through, you can do anything in your faith. Now, if your faith is strong and things are going great with you in God, remember there's going to come a time when trouble will come. And this is one of those verses we can hold on because you can know that in all things, God is good. God is good even when you're praying for somebody, you're praying for that loved one, even when you're questioning God, why did you allow that to happen? All things work together for the good and this will matter. And you know that verse actually says all things. All things. I can tell you, we can find a blessing that in all things. Do you know why? Because in all things, we are not faithful. Think of your, your journey with God. How Have you been faithful all the days of your life? No, if we're honest with ourselves, we are the ones that run from God. We pursue our own desires. We go our own ways. We do these things. And in those moments, we kind of go, what was I thinking? We look back and we go, God, I've, I've left you. I followed my own desires. I've made my own choices. I've done my own ways. And it says, in all things, even in our unfaithfulness. That's a promise. We should be holding more to the promise of that than just that God is going to do something in this. We should be holding on to that promise that in all things, God is at work. Even when I turn my back on Him. Even when I deserve that punishment, that God has been faithful and He's been good. All things work together. But we have to be careful because this verse is not for anyone. This is a verse that should be claimed by those who know Christ. And so often we want good for every single person around us. You know what the greatest good we can find in this world? Is to know God. That is is heaven. To know God and that He knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows what you're going to do. He knows when you're going to go wrong. He knows every step you're going to take and that He knows you. That is the greatest treasure in this world. Then gaining this entire world is to know God. So this verse is that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. is not a claim for the world. 
It's a claim for everybody who has put their faith and hope and trust in him. For do you know why? He's called you to a purpose. And this is the difference, you know? So often people come to church because we want to be blessed, right? Eh? Some of us. I remember, you know, um, there's been times in my, like, God, if I just do this, then you will do that. And that's not how it works in God's economy. Knowing God is the blessing in our lives. And we've got to live in a way that when we follow him with all of our heart, we are blessable, but it doesn't guarantee blessings. We've got to remember that this verse is to those who he has called according to his purpose. So be careful of giving this verse to somebody who doesn't know Christ. It's a reminder that in your life that I've put my faith and hope and trust in one who is above all things. And so I live for his glory and not my own. And he will guide my every step and every path. He has a plan for those who trust their lives to him. Second thing he says, it's in all things. Have you ever taken something out of context? You know, there, there's three good arguments that Jesus was Jewish. Okay, if you didn't know Jesus was Jewish, there's three good arguments. One, he went into his father's business. Um, he lived at home until he was at least 30 or 33. And then he was sure his mother was a virgin and that his father was God. Okay, but there's also three equally good arguments that Jesus was Italian. We often find that he talked with his hands. Um, he would have wine with his meals, and he used olive oil. Okay. We also know there's three good reasons that Jesus could have been from, from Zini, for instance. He never cut his hair. He was barefoot most of the time, and he was starting a new religion. Um, but there's also, there's also arguments that Jesus was a woman. I mean... He freed a crowd at a moment's notice when there was virtually no food anywhere, just five loaves and some bread. He kept trying to get a message across to a bunch of men who just didn't seem to get it. And even when he was dead, he still had to get up because there was work to be done. Yeah, that's my bit of humor for today. All things. I know many, many people in this world have gone through difficult times. But I've also seen the fruits of people who have lost and come through. You know what I find in our stories when it comes to faith and trusting in God? Is that we cannot let that one moment become the filter upon which we see our entire lives. We cannot let one moment where we've messed up or when we've had doubts, God, why has this happened? Where that becomes the filter for the rest of our lives. And I can tell you now, when you're in that moment, you question God. God, where are you? Why did you allow this to happen? We need to see our struggles in the context of all of our lives. Not just the one moment. If we're really honest with ourselves, and we had to write a log of how God has been faithful in times when he hasn't or where we thought he hasn't been, you'll find that we are blessed more than what we can count. Even when he has to discipline us. Who enjoys punishing their child? Don't put your hands up. Richard, put your hand down. Okay. Kids, who think their parents do enjoy disciplining them? No. I mean, which parents find satisfaction in discipline? Yet, what happens when we don't discipline? Hey, Sam, why are we shaking your head there? Eh? <laughs> Listen to this here from Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, it says, And you, and you have forgotten that the, will, that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My sons, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? You know, I used to sometimes think about my parents. Why would they be so 
their rules. We're so stupid sometimes. Eh? Why would we discipline? But there's a reason why I'm still alive today. Because of some of these stupid rules. This is, this is in Romans 8, and this is where this passage starts to come alive. Our hardship has a purpose. Our hardship has a purpose, no matter how hard it is. I used this quote last week. All things are either God sent or God used. See, God is doing something in the situation to mold us. To mold us into the character and the purpose that he has for us. Or he's using that situation. He's using the very circumstances of this world, and it's a sinful world, and it's a world that is that is out, and, and, and Satan is like a, a prowling lion waiting to devour all of us. He uses those circumstances. You know what? We may have stumbled and fallen. Yeah, our life, the world may have got, it seems like, the better of us. But God has got a plan. But lastly, the good. Good. I asked this question when I started, what is good? What is good? Is the life committed to God good or easy? Should we be exempt from pain and suffering, struggles, health? You see, this is, this is where Romans 8 verse 28 comes into effect. The good is not our good. It's his. Let me try to hope we make an example of this. I mean, the disciples. When you look at the disciples, you know, they all lived until they were ripe old ages and they had hundreds of grandchildren and great-grandchildren and their parents never ran, uh, their pensions never ran out and were well above inflation and their health was better than when they were when they were 18. No, this is not the story. When you look at the disciples, the very ones who were with Christ, their endings were not good. What is the ultimate good Paul speaks of here? And if you actually look at verse 29, he uses this. He says, the good is this, that we will be conformed to the likeness of the Son. That we will be conformed to the likeness of the Son. You know what is good? When we become more like Jesus. Not, not when the circumstance and our worries are, are, are taken away. Not when the thing we've been praying for is given to us. Not when that person gets healed or that, that sickness disappears. Do you know what is good? that we would become more like Christ in this world. That is the ultimate goal and the ultimate purpose of man, to be more like Jesus, conformed to the image of his son. We need to live with this definition. We need to live that in every single circumstance when we are doubting God, to be able to turn to God and say, God, I don't know what the plan and purpose in this, but I trust you. And I pray that I would be more like Christ, that I would respond, that I would have faith, that I would believe. So Jesus turns around and he says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. All things, no matter what they are, no matter how hard, how trying, no matter how not good they are, God makes a promise. He says, in all these things, I will have a purpose. Not my will, but your will be done. See, when you when you find God more and more, when you when you learn, and Paul Paul hints to the secret. He he always turns around. He says, "In view of," Paul in a lot of his writings would always say, "In view of." Because there's this understanding that Paul said, as, as I know more of Christ, as I know more of what, who he is and what he's done, in view of him, this world has changed, my life has changed, my view has changed. 
as our desire moves from the things around us towards Him, to be more like Him, so we find that there is good no matter what happens. This will will pass. But how it passes in your life is God's glory. And as Christ is, uh, as God has made victorious through the tragedy of His Son, our lives in the hand of God will see this world changed. Will see us at peace, our hearts at rest, no matter what we face. When all things, hard, painful, joyous, lovely, God takes those things and shapes them for His plan through us. morning as we end off, this is where we're supposed to go into communion. I'm always reminded that communion is a place of honest doubt, a place of honest heartache. Lord, you said this would happen, but yet you've died. It's a place where the disciples go back to doing what they were doing before they met Christ. You know, Peter was still a terrible fisherman. And Jesus has to go out to him again. He says, listen, you're still a terrible fisherman. Put it on the other side. And he does. And he he throws off everything. He comes back to Christ. Because it's in all things, even when we turn our back and leave God, even when we question him, even when we come in our anger and our pain, God says, I'm so much greater than your your anger. I'm so much greater than, than your wrong. I'm so much greater than anything you could say against me. My love is always there. My calling to you for his purpose is there. So that no matter what season we're in, there can be fruit, there can be joy, there can be hope. That's what communion was about and is about. It's an honest, an honest time to say, God, I need you. God, I'm reminded that you have a purpose even when the worst has happened around us. So I'm going to ask us just to bow our heads. I'm going to read Romans 8. Because often when this world, when the things of this world, when the circumstance, when it's a person literally sitting in hospital, when it's a, um, when it's a job deal that's just, going wrong, when it's a work situation where you're just being victimized and hated and Satan is trying to use everything just to, you're saying, God, where are you? Why can't you? I'm doing everything right. It's that relationship that has gone completely wrong. You're trying to fix it, but it's just not working. It's in those moments when the physical stuff around us, which we put our hope and trust and plans in, When those things fail us, and they will fail us, God says, there is a plan and a purpose. It's found in Him. Romans 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love and have been called according to His purpose. For those He knew, He he planned to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that they may be the firstborn amongst many, and those he planned, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. What then shall we say? Who can be against us? God did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? None of these, as it's written, for your sake we face death all day long and considers as sheep to the slaughter. In all these things, we are more than conquerors because of him who loves us. Because I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, whether the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor heart, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, thank you for these words over our lives this morning.